So we've called this session The Search for Truth. <coughs> oh, I shan't introduce everybody. I think you've met everybody already, but just to name them, Michael Levitt, Frank Vilcek, Peter Doherty, Shirin Abadi, Stephen Chu, David Gross, and Joseph Stiglitz. We've called it The Search for Truth because in a way, in their own disciplines, that is what unites them, their search for truth. But something else that unites them as Nobel laureates is the creativity they employ in that search. And so I'd like to begin by discussing that creativity. And let's start by trying to work out what we mean by the term creativity. <laughs> I'm looking for some enthusiasm for that question in their eyes. Oh, I've got some. Good, Michael. So uh, creativity is really interesting because if you ask anyone who's creative where it comes from, they don't usually know. I haven't met anybody who gets up in the morning and writes down a list saying things to be creative about and then item one, no, I did that, item two. It seems to come from walking the dog, taking showers, watching TV, and doing something which is actually non-scientific. So I think creativity is a mysterious thing. It's also clear that there are people who are serial creative people, but I think it's very difficult to know what really makes. And I think there's a certain level of messiness that makes you creative. David. Well, you know, unfortunately, I think all of us will agree we have no idea where creativity <laughs> comes from. And that's quite unfortunate because if we knew, we could teach it. And we can't, or at least we know ways of encouraging it, but not teaching it. But I think it's clearly related to our, our illusion that the conscious I is somehow in control of even our thoughts. So I'm, I often have the experience of, uh, you know, in situations like this, being asked provocative questions like you just asked, and then saying something, not on this occasion, because I've said it before, <laughs> uh, saying something that is novel and new and creative and surprises me, and I said, my God, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. <laughs> so it comes from some other place that is not conscious, I have no doubt. And uh, these, the brain consists of many parts we understand now, of neuroscience, different modules. Creativity is located somewhere there and is a surprise often to the conscious self. Uh, so I have no idea what it is. There are ways, however, of fostering it. Uh, and just, just to follow up, what conditions do you find yourself most creative in? Is there something you can point to? I think uh, what, is, what definitely uh, motivates creativity is concentration. You know, just concentrating in a bulldog fashion on a problem. And then that encourages the unconscious mind, you know, the part of our brain that actually does the work, <laughs> to work away and then come up with a new idea, a new way of looking at things, yeah. which, but how it happens, I have no idea. But concentration is crucial. Enthusiasm is growing. Frank, then Joe. Frank <laughs> first. Well, first, my personal experience, my best work, I think, has come from immersing myself in some subject, some problem and then getting annoyed, realizing that something, something could be better, something, or there, there have been unexplored possibilities. Uh, but I also resonate with what David said. I was asked a very similar question <laughs> a couple of days ago in a similar venue and said something along those lines, a little different, that our brain indeed consists of a, is a community. It's different pieces that have different skills, different languages, and uh, some of them are logical, some of them are pattern recognition. Uh, you might say aesthetic, because they want patterns to click and make sense. And uh, I think uh, at least one important ingredient of, of uh, creativity is to get all these guys communicating and pulling in the same direction. And, uh, so that's the process of, as people call it intuition, you see a pattern, you don't, you, you kind of identify a goal, but you don't know how to get there logically, and then you reconstruct some path. It doesn't always work, doesn't always exist, but when it exists, that's 
the important creative process. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff. Yeah, I, I want to just add one, one dimension, which is a uh, questioning of what uh, you, you were taught uh, before, or the standard model. So <laughs> it begins with, with uh, discounting, you know, skepticism <laughs> of... Uh, and I also think it begins, as I said, not a, uh, with a question of, of wanting to answer something that is wrong with what is the standard wisdom. And then finally, one other ingredient is, is this... Uh, being exposed to uh, ideas that are very different and the, the process of how those ideas meet the problem <laughs> and skepticism is a very uh, mystical one, <laughs> but you have to be exposed to these other sources of ideas so that you can, this creative melting pot occurs. Yeah, how could anyone possibly think that? is often yeah. a very exactly. provocative <laughs> kind of yeah. way of getting yourself moving. I want to get everybody's views on this one. So Steve first, and then Shirin. Steve? Well, uh, for me, it, it's, it's a few things. Um, a rebellious streak, um, not willing to accept things <laughs> as you hear them. Uh, but also, when I go into a new field, uh, that's where I think um, I get the most excited. Um, I, you know... Uh, unencumbered with knowledge, and uh, this is a very good thing, uh, but I would also link with people who are experts in the field, who are willing to put up with questions like, what about this, and you know, they would have to patiently explain to me, no, that's not right, or yes, but someone else has thought about that, and maybe in one or two percent of the ch times, they will say, hmm, <laughs> let's think some more. And so it, 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 to have those collaborators be willing to put up with you and uh, teach you, and it includes my students and postdocs, um, that is actually, for me, the most exciting time, and that's why you know, I lurch uh, around. Thank you. So, Shirin Ibadi, and then I'll come. <laughs> علوم که اینجا لوریت ها صحبت کردن با رشته من که حقوق تفاوت میکنه Now the meaning of creativity differs from sphere to sphere so it's what how I see creativity is different from the definitions given by my esteemed scientist uh, colleagues here من همواره به دنبال ادالت بودم و سعی می کردم که قوانینی برای برقراری ادالت اجتماعی بنویسم. I have always been in pursuit of justice. To that end, I have always tried to come up with ideas for legislation towards implementation of social justice. و من خلاقیتم رو یعنی و افکار جدیدی که به من به مغزم میاد فقط در اثر این است که با خود سوژه برخورد بکنم یعنی لمس بکنم و ببینم بی ادالتی یعنی چه I become creative when I actually immerse myself in an idea and to see how for example can fight injustice و به همین دلیله که من یکی از کارهایی که همیشه می کنم این است که با هوملس ها و یا افرادی بی خانمان ها دائما در ارتباطم. So one of the things I do to that end is to constantly try and be in touch with homeless or displaced people. و از اونا خیلی چیزا یاد می گیرم. And I learned so much from them. برای اینکه هیچ کس ظلم رو مثل مظلوم نمیتونه بیان کنه because no one can actually uh, speak about oppression as uh, somebody who's been oppressed و وقتی که شما یه چیزی رو درک کردید اون وقت راه حل هم فکر کنید با با تجربه و تخصصی که دارید پیدا می‌کنید 
So the key is first to understand a problem and then draw on your own experiences and skills in a bit to find solutions to that problem. But one thing I need to stress is that our creativity is of no use without political resolve. یعنی بهترین افکارها و بهترین قوانین برای برقراری عدالت زمانی می تواند مفید باشد که یک حکومت دموکرات بخواد اجراش کنه. In other words, the best opinions and the best legislation can only be effective towards uh, uh, establishment of justice if there is a democratic government to implement those uh, opinions and ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And again, it brings out the ideas of concentration and exposure to other influences, which is so important and has been brought out by others. Peter, you haven't spoken on this one yet. Oh, oh creativity in science, I think most of it's been said, often happens, discovery, insight, novelty, often happens when you come into a field from outside. Uh, so you're not trapped by the perceptions of the field, which can be stultifying. Um, I, I mean, I think we all know scientists who are actually terrified of discovering anything because it would put them outside the norm and they'd feel very uncomfortable by it. You, you can't be that sort of personality. Uh, creativity can come, uh, Francis Crick and Jim Watson, two very different personalities, uh, different backgrounds, talked and talked and talked, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, annoyed everybody else. Uh, dragged stuff out from this person and that person, stole everything and made a synthesis. <laughs> uh, very creative. Uh, Crick, after he and Watson split up, did the same thing with Sidney Brenner. Uh, you've got three Nobel Prize winners there. So uh, creativity is right across society in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of different people. I, I think it, the creative person can often be an extremely annoying person. They're annoying to be around. They see things differently from the way that everybody else sees them. It makes them very discomforting. They're not particularly liked. They're social outcasts at times. Um, creativity is, uh, can be a bit of a burden and a bit of a bore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the curse of creativity, yes. <laughs> the, um, you've mentioned the immersion, concentration. Uh, how important in your own lives has creativity been as opposed to just good hard work? That's one for the graduate <laughs> students to listen to, right? <laughs> Who wants to take that? Peter? Or? Uh, well, a lot of breakthroughs in biomedical science actually come from better technology. And, and we, we'd have to ask the answer, uh, thank the physicists often for that, and uh, the chemists and all the rest of it. Because you, you, you're worrying about a problem, you're seeing a problem, and you're not seeing it because you don't see clearly enough. So, so it's often, as the biblical saying, you know, through a glass darkly we see in part, uh, and then you see better. And when you see better, you understand better and you measure better because science is about measurement. And if we're talking about truth, you know, that, these are universals. The, 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 we're talking about the future of truth today. Well, basically the truth for science hasn't changed at all in 400 years. I mean, the, basically the mechanisms are the same, the rules are the same, the product is the same. So the, 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 that, that, that is the future of science. It, it's when... It's the future of truth in the broader context that we're, we can, we're concerned about. So, yeah. I actually try to avoid hard work <laughs> when, things yeah. look, when things look complicated and difficult. To, that's often a sign that there's a d different way, a better way to do it. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Michael, I'll come to you in a second. Just there, there's another, uh, there are a few, uh, as I said, um, ways of promoting creativity, and, and I think Steve talked about one of them, which is going, to, uh, going into a new field, or posing a new question, uh, which is not necessarily yet a discovery, but just approaching a new question that most people ignore because they think it's too hard or because... <laughs> It is too hard, <laughs> and, and uh, so empty territory is a great place for creativity. It's very easy to come up with the first ide good ideas in a field, and once breakthroughs are then made, uh, the easy ones, the crowd rushes in, <laughs> and it gets harder and harder. Yeah. Um, 
Science um, is also, over 400 years, developed enormously. We now have millions of scientists. Mm -hmm. There used to be hundreds. Uh, and uh, it's... So one lesson to... I try to tell my students, give them hints as to how to be successful as a creative, productive scientist is to go where the crowds aren't. Uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Steve? Sorry, Michael. Okay, so just very quickly, uh, what Peter said, I, my whole career I've been trying to develop instruments, invent new instruments. And uh, because I realized there's so many more people smarter than me, and, but if you are the first to look under a rock with a new <laughs> instrument, you don't have to be smart. And, and so that, and so continuing just, you know, okay, wh what new instrument or what new method or what new technique or what new now, nanoprobe, uh, it's, and so I try to teach people who are equally incompetent and dumb <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, invent the new instrument, invent the new method, and then the world mm. opens up. Michael, you were going to do. So I guess, uh, like Frank, most of my work has been theoretical. And just thinking back, as I have over the last couple of minutes, um, I think most of the time you're just working hard. But I would guess I've probably had, I don't know, five or six good ideas in my life. So firstly, it's an amazing feeling. It's, it's a high that is really incredible when you get it. Sometimes they don't work out. Maybe I've had ten ideas and half of them didn't work out. But I think in some ways, it's one of the reasons why being a scientist is so great, to have an idea, to feel it's going to be OK, and then slowly work it out, and it comes out to be OK. So I think, in some ways, creative ideas are the very heart about the best part about science. Thank you. Joe? Yeah. Well, I'm an economist, and some of the people here would uh, doubt the use of the word science for uh, what I, for, you know, and doubt whether we should have a Nobel Prize for uh, economic. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you didn't say that. But, uh, but, but the, the, I want to just make two points. One, I, I agree very strongly that uh, uh, concentration is important. Um, and in some sense, some kind of hard work, but sometimes people who work very hard uh, <laughs> don't, you know, because they're looking in the wrong place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. And this is where I think economics is different from the other subjects, uh, which is uh, it's not usually a new instrument uh, that, you know, or a new data set. So if you take, say, a problem like inequality, it was obviously sitting there. Uh, it was that the ideology was so strong that nobody wanted to talk about it. Or the question of the existence of imperfect information, that was a question where they didn't know how to think about this mathematically mm -hmm. and were afraid to go there. So in both of those cases, it was, it was not a, a new discovery. Uh, the, the facts were obvious, but it was really the, the, the willingness uh, or the uh, saying, this is probably important and you ought to concentrate your mind to figure out whether it is or not and how it affects uh, our discipline. Thank you. Shirin, it strikes me that hard work is at the very core of the achievements you've been able to uh, be part of. Albatta ke kar ziyad va sakh ba har hal baraye har muvaffaqiyati zaruriye, vali kan begu it's, of course, it's obvious that hard work is necessary for any kind of achievement. But this kind of hard work and diligence must, have, um, must be targeted. دارید و بهتر اون هدف یک چیز یک رشته نو و حرف جدید باشه. And so you have to concentrate on that goal and of course it would be good if that is an innovative idea and it's a new idea. در رشته من کتاب های خیلی زیادی نوشته شده ولی کن میتونم بگم متاسفانه اکثر اونها یک حرف و هی دام به زبان های مختلف تکرار میکنن. 
In my field of work, many books have been written, but regrettably, a lot of them are constantly repeating the same things. What is important is to come up with a new idea. As a to, for, for scientific new ideas, I'm glad I'm not a physicist and I don't need to worry about that kind of new <laughs> ideas. So uh, you can ask my esteemed colleagues about that here. Thank you. Okay, well, we're running very close to the end. Uh, let's change tack slightly. We've had a meeting about the future of truth, and I think it might be appropriate to end by say, asking you whether you feel hopeful for the future of truth or not. You're nodding, Michael. Does that mean you are? I'm definitely optimistic. As I said before, I think the changing, the fact that the Western world is becoming the whole world, at least in terms of ideals of capitalism and uh, wanting to invent things and improve standards of living, I think it's really hopeful because it means that no one has a monopoly of everything. Well, I'm very optimistic because I think the nature of the truth is that it builds and accumulates, whereas errors fall away. So in the long run, truth will win. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in, in the end, as, as I think Feynman said it, reality can't be denied. It's just a matter of how the process of how you get there. The processes that we use in science to get there don't, don't really change. And I, don't, I think within science, though we've had certain issues with fraud and so forth, I think that modern technology really defeats much of that. And, uh, and we're not going to see the problem. The problem is to get uh, our political and uh, masters and broader society to accept those truths before they become really dangerous. Right, thank you. So at the point of having three scientists' um, views, we're optimistic. Now, Shirin Evadi. <laughs> The future of civilization is going towards progress. There are many things that were merely dreams for humanity, and now they have actually materialized. Since everyone else has focused on the United States except me, let me say a few words about the U US to make sure that there's been justice. <laughs> what did she say? She said, Sorry, the US that America میتونه there was a time in the United States when no African American had any freedom, and then suddenly an African American became president of the United States and very popular. And then after that, he was succeeded by a white American. Yet we can see how this white American is now being criticized <laughs> and that African American is being praised. بنابراین به همون دلیل خیلی از چیزایی که امروز بر ما رویاست در آینده تحقق خواهد پذیرفت. So that is why a lot of things that today we see just as a dream are bound to materialize in the future. Thank you. That's a hard act to follow, Steve, but go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, yes, I'm optimistic. Um, scientists have to be optimistic because we fail most of the time uh, because we're trying to do some new things. Uh, and so, um, and I, you know, to be brief, I think truth will trump Trump. 
<laughs> you know, uh, the I, scientists are generally optimistic. Sometimes, however, they are pessimistic, but most of the time they're optimistic. I've uh, pondered that, and I've come to the conclusion that partly that's because science is not easy, it's difficult, and the optimists simply, the pessimists simply quit. So the only people who survive <laughs> and succeed are the optimists. So I am very much an optimist. I believe that science will survive Trump, of course, and truth will ultimately prevail because what else is there? <laughs> Lies? And so, but uh, we should be wary of overly, being overly optimistic, even with uh, Barack Obama, uh, and so on. Humanity uh, has gone through declines in the past, in the recent past, in the last two millennium. It's not always been progress. The Roman Empire fell apart in Europe and led to a thousand years of dark ages and, and uh, non-truth. Mm -hmm. So we should be careful and vigilant and make sure that we trump Trump. It's, it's okay. If it's, it's hard to be over, overly optimistic if you're a British just at the moment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Well, economists are known as the dismal science. And uh, while well, I do agree that over the long run, uh, truth will, pre will prevail, Keynes had this very famous statement of, in the long run, <laughs> we're all dead. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I'm a little bit with David here, saying, uh, worried about the, the battle that is going to be going on uh, over uh, the immediate future. And I don't think uh, it is obvious uh, so that, that what will happen. Um, and uh, unless there is really very active opposition, uh, the, the uh, words of whether Trump will trump it or not, uh, is really still open uh, in the air. Thank you very much indeed. OK. Sadly, that is it. We're out of time. I would like to thank our, our partners who make all this possible. That's Carl Burnett AB, the city of Gothenburg, Ericsson, and I always dread this one, the Region Vestra Jutland. Also, our supporters in Stena Stiftelsen. That's also difficult for, for a Brit. Um, I would particularly like to thank all our participants today and our assembled Nobel laureates, and also especially you, the audience, for being here. Thank you all, and see you in Stockholm in 2018. <laughs>